say love is what makes a marriage work is like saying it takes oxygen to climb a mountain. Yes, oxygen is necessary, but not sufficient. Clinical therapist and marriage coach Anna Gabrielle Mann and her husband, New York Times bestselling author John David Mann, are the authors of The Go-Giver Marriage, a little story about the five secrets to lasting love. Let's start at the beginning. Did you both reach for the same book at the library or swipe right on an app? Please share the story of how the two of you met and a bit about your marriage. We reached for the same book. It was this one right here. <laughs> Winning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll start by saying this. When we were kids in our twenties, one night we both attended the same party and we had a Tony and Maria moment, like right out of West Side Story. Our eyes met across a crowded room and we saw each other. And I'll, I won't speak for Anna, but for me, I thought, she's really cute. This is like a person looks fasc fascinating. <laughs> we never met. We never, I didn't even know her name. We never spoke a word until 20 years later when we both showed up for the same business event and happened to be involved in the same business enterprise. And we ended up as, as business colleagues and became fast friends and read all the same books and loved all the same books. And, and over the years, that friendship turned into something more. Gosh. That is <laughs> crazy. So it wasn't 20 until 20 years later that you actually came together. Wow, that is that is amazing. And so, so what can you say about your marriage? So it started out um, being fast friends and then evolving from there. Anything more you'd like to share about this incredible meeting and coming together? Sure. I think I would say that there really were immediate sparks even at, at 20 when we saw each other across the room. And when we met 20 years later, we had both grown so much that there was a very different intellectual bond that happened as well, where we were just like, very, you know, John is brilliant. And I found that conversations between us were like lightning and there was just a lot to say and we had a lot in common. Uh, so, you know, it was a kind of a magical beginning in a certain way, but we remained good friends for almost 10 years after that. And that, and I guess I will say we had a very long courtship because we had five teenagers between us from previous, we both had a previous marriage. Mm -hmm. And so we had five teenagers and we weren't interested in, in basically creating what we'd call in America, the Brady Bunch. Um, yeah, we weren't interested in merging five teenagers. So we spent a long time getting to know each other and a long time dating. And it was, that was part of the power of our relationship actually, is that there wasn't any hurry to get married um, we both knew that we were in the right place and it was just really about making sure that our children were comfortable and that everything was really in the right place. Wow. That is, that is an incredible, incredible, incredible story. Um, you know, it's a, a marriage with lasting love, um, as you speak about, uh, requires overcoming obstacles. Question for you today, as a married couple that helps other married couples. Is there a personal story that you could share about an obstacle of your own that you had to work to overcome? Sweetheart? Sure. <laughs> this is a complex, <laughs> this is a complex story. Uh, not only had we both had marriages before, but our kids were still at home. Mm -hmm. uh, we navigated the first few years of getting to know each other and dating, living in two states that were 10 hours apart. And we, John spent two weeks in Virginia with his children and then spent two weeks in Massachusetts with us. And I was not interested in him sharing a bed when I, I had, a, had a teenage daughter with special needs and I was not interested in confusing her in any way. So for the first year or two, John had an apartment separate from our house. When he finally moved into our house, he lived in a bedroom downstairs with a private bath 
at the other end of the house, away from the two bedrooms and the shared bath that my daughter and I had upstairs. Um, so that was one challenge. And that was, you know, that I really wanted my daughter to be comfortable. I wanted no strangeness for her. Um, I wanted to make certain that um, if she needed any kind of, I wouldn't say reprimanding, because that's really not a part of our our way of being. But I mean, if she needed any kind of correction in her path, that that was mm -hmm. at my hands, not at his. Um, There's one authority in the house. Right. Yeah, yeah, there was one authority in the house and there were there were clear boundaries. Um, and but then during the 10 years that we were dating and and really we knew we wanted to be a couple in a, and we knew we wanted to be married. Um, all of our parents died during that time and there were illnesses. There were times when one of our parents had five surgeries in two years. And um, and so understanding that I had a teenage daughter it was my mother. And I had a teenage daughter who was at a tender age and couldn't live alone. So at times, John lived in Massachusetts and watched my daughter and took care of the house, made sure everything was good for her while I was in Florida, attending to my mother and advocating for her at a hospital. Yeah. Um, and so those were very challenging situations, yeah. followed by me breaking my leg in a compound fracture with over 30 fracture lines. And I didn't walk for over a year. I didn't walk for over a year. What? So, yeah. So you put all those together and um, it was a very challenging 10 years. And that was all before we were married and in the first year we were married. Man, that's, um, so, yeah. Well, that's quite an obstacle. That's quite a series of obstacles, actually. <laughs> Um, it's tempting. This it's tempting. It's tempting to say in times of difficulty. I know that there are people who've said in their minds, "I didn't sign up for this." Yeah, you actually you did. You signed up for everything. You when you when you fall in love with somebody, when you start a relationship with somebody, you sign up for the for the universe. You sign up for for whatever whatever happens. You're you're in. That's that's beautiful. And yeah, because we do hear that all the time. I didn't sign up for this. Well, but no, you did. Yes, yes you did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it said, that's your name I, that's your name right there at the bottom of the page yeah. <laughs> signed it <laughs> wow well you know i'm, I'm going to get a, a, a little bit deeper here with this next question and it is patience trust forgiveness is there an order of importance when it comes to marriage so looking to the experts here what should be at the top of that list in your opinion can i, can I speak to this i'm going to say Top of my list would be patience. And by top, I don't mean most important, I mean comes first. Mm. Um, when when Anna and I did, did you know, we've been friends and colleagues for years, and we did fall in love and, and the relationship deepened. I wanted to get married immediately, right now. I knew that if I didn't get married to her right now, I would die. It would be like taking away food and water for a month. I would expire on the floor. And. Um, she said, uh, I, I, we can't do this, this is too soon. And I fought it like a child having his, having his lollipop taken away. <laughs> I was at a tantrum. But she was absolutely right. Patience was called for. And you know, in retrospect, I, I, would, I would wish that I had been more patient first time around. Um, it takes time, it, I'll speak from my experience, it certainly has taken me time to come to an a real understanding of who I am, just in myself, let alone who I am in a relationship. And I think one of the great failings of my first marriage, I was married to somebody who was a great person. We're all great people. Every human human being alive is put here as a great person. But I was too young. I, it was too early. It was too fast. I didn't know who I was. We weren't we weren't a good match. We shouldn't have ever gotten married. It was a bad idea. The day I got married, I got married in a big Catholic church. My first wife was from a big Catholic family, and I don't have a Catholic background. The priest took me into a back room before the ceremony and showed me, without explaining a word, just a saying, or showed me where the back door was, and waited a few <laughs> moments. It was only years later that I realized he was giving me a message. He knew this family. <laughs> he, he, and, uh, he literally showed me the door. Um, it, it would have been wise 
if I had had some introspection at that time, but you know, uh, we have had had to have a lot of patience. Uh, this the hardships that Anna described. You know, I think pa it sometimes it takes patience for the other two things you described: forgiveness and trust uh, to unfold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, and that's that's a wonderful answer and. Um, I hear you. So it's the patience that feeds the trust, that feeds the forgiveness and allows those two to, to grow and to evolve them. Uh, so I want to I want to shift gears right now to to the book that you pointed to a moment ago. Uh, so a storybook, a guidebook, a discussion guide, all in one. Please tell us about the tools that we find in the book that the two of you co-authored The Go-Giver marriage the go-giver marriage is really you know there's two sides to it two halves the first half is called the parable and the second half is called the practice and the first premise of the practice is it's the guide it's how to put the parable into action in your marriage but it's also a statement on what love is that just like a meditation practice or a prayer practice or a yoga practice you know, your marriage will only be as good as the energy you put into the practice of marriage. People think when they get married that love is a state of being, that once you feel that euphoric romantic love, that that's going to be there forever simply because you feel it right now. But the truth is life happens, you know, things happen. And, and even if life is relatively calm, you arrive at marriage with many, many suitcases of personal history. And all those suitcases start magically unpacking as soon as the honeymoon's over, really. And the intimacy of the marriage is challenged by whatever personal material that you had in your history. For example, if you had a father who was very dismissive and very critical, then you kind of have a choice. And I've said this to many um, of the clients that I've had who had that father. You have a choice. You're either going to be the person who's dismissive and critical, or you're going to marry the person who's dismissive and critical oh. because you're seeking to heal. And so, you know, that's the, the basic premise of the book is that love is a practice and the better you get at practicing, the stronger your marriage will be. The more patient you are, as you asked in the last question, the more the trust will build the more the compassion will be there. Um, and all the elements that make a marriage great are born out of practicing what we call the five secrets to lasting love. And the five secrets are based on developmental theory. And what I mean by that is developmental theory is the psychology of what did you need when you were a child that you also needed when you were an adolescent. And guess what? You also need it now. So developmental theory, even though we grow up and we become independent, all the things that we needed in early childhood, we still need today. And so all of the five secrets and in the second half of the book, the practice are not only explained in the context of what each one means developmentally to you and why it's important and critical. Um, and also what happens when you don't get it because you can feed a marriage or starve a marriage. You know, we have this tree in the background and that's an element that's in the parable. The, the, the parable has a wonderful little fable inside the parable and there's a tree, a very magical tree. And the tree really is the marriage and the marriage can either be fed or it can be starved and the tree will reflect it. The marriage itself will reflect that. Are you feeding it or are you starving it? And when you practice these five secrets, it's as if you're and I don't want to say raising a child, but when you're raising a child, there are things that that child needs. And if they don't get those things they need, there'll be huge holes in their development. You can even arrest a child's development altogether with, you know, a certain amount of neglect. I mean, neglect is probably more profound than direct abuse when it comes to a child. Neglect leaves that child with no resources whatsoever. And people neglect each other in marriages all the time. People think that having an affair is the big deal, but people ignore each other. 
They have friendships at work that are really powerful and important, so-called outside emotional relationships. They have, there's so many ways that you can, can neglect your partner. And so what we're really trying to share is a recipe, if you will, for how do you drop the scorecard? How do you stop keeping score with your partner? Because that's just another form of criticism. As long as you're keeping score, you're still trying to figure out what did I get and what did I lose? Mm -hmm. You know, I did the dishes three times this week. What have you done? You know, that's really not going to get you there. That's, that's a recipe for failure. And so we want to help people to learn how to drop the scorecard, be self-aware, be emotionally mature and emotionally intelligent um, when things get rough. And to give people the skills, everyday skills, that will make such a difference in their marriage. That is awesome. Well, it sounds like an incredible recipe for sure. Um, I'm terrible in the kitchen, so I, I don't know much about those sorts of recipes, <laughs> but the recipe that you've just shared is one I think I would love to, uh, to explore. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so one final question for the two of you today is, uh, you know, I'm not going to ask you to give away the five secrets, but I wondered if you could just share one secret. Go sure. ahead, John. No, go ahead. Right. Share one. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll share one and I'll just share the first secret. Um, they, they sort of become progressively more uh, deep in a sense. Um, the first is the first is really accessible and it's one that we all know. It's one that we all put into practice when we're first in love. It's one that we all know intuitively. And if we're parents, we know that we have to do it for our kids and we do it spontaneously, but we can forget it over time with each other. And it's simply called appreciate. Um, the first secret is to take the time every day, multiple times a day. We have people start with three times a day. Take the time to find something about your partner that you love and take a moment to tell them about it. There's two parts to it. It's finding the thing that you love, noticing, taking the time to notice, and then also saying it out loud to the other person. And that may just take 30 seconds. It may take 60 seconds. It's a little thing. Um, for some people that can, that can feel awkward, like we've been married for 15 years and all of a sudden I'm supposed to tell you what I love about you. It feels kind of weird, especially guys for some reason will get like weird about this. It can be like using a muscle that you haven't used for 15 years. But if you stop your spouse and say, I just want to tell you the way that you talked to me yesterday when I was so upset and I and I was pissed off about something that happened at work, I was upset about something that was going on with my life. And I didn't even know how to put it in words, but you just talked to me and you made me feel so much better about myself. I really appreciate that. That's all. Boom. Go on with our day. These can be huge things, but these can be simple things. Mm -hmm. Three times a day, we even have people make a list on paper. Um, and, and build the list. The cool thing about this, Allie, is that, is that as you go in your marriage, you keep looking for new things to add on your list every day. It's like a gratitude list. It is a gratitude list in a sense. You, the more things you find, the more things there are to, find, to, to look for. The more you look, the more you discover. It's like a treasure hunt. You engage in a treasure hunt about the other person. And the the fascinating thing is that can last and will last the rest of your life. Every individual is an unexplored continent of great things to love and appreciate about them. If you go looking, you'll go finding. I'm sorry, I'm going to try to not be a little bit teary right now because that is, um, <laughs> that is really beautiful. And I love that it's something that's so simple, that's so practical. Yes. Um, you know, it's just like you say, like, if you look for it, you'll find it. And um, wow, I, I will say I am excited to tell Jack three things about him that I'm absolutely in love with. And um, <laughs> I think the thing there, not only does it make him feel better, I imagine I will be feeling better as well. Just that recognition will not only serve him, but I think myself as well. Um, and certainly both of us together. Um, it's that you always, exactly. as you give, you get. It happens, I think, in the same moment. And what a gift it is um, yes. that we have to share with one another. So it does. Thank you. Gratitude, gratitude is just so powerful in the way that it impacts your brain and your nervous system. 
There's a long body of research on happiness that says that people who are givers, and all five of these secrets are about giving, mm -hmm. people who are givers live longer. Every cell in their body is, is affected by giving. Their heart is healthier. They have less depression. And they are just generally more buoyant. They bounce back from things much more powerfully than others. And it's, you know, gratitude is just a part of that giving. When you have gratitude, everything in your world expands. I mean, it's just one of the most powerful thing, emotions. Um, it will really just bring brand new things to your life on a silver platter, if you will. Um, but in your relationship, intimacy will just deepen. I mean, it, it, it becomes so sweet. And it's such a simple thing to enact. And you can do it on text as well. I mean, I, I've had clients who, you know, they're flirting on text with appreciation. And it's really powerful. I mean, it's like the, the couples are, you know, 16, 17 years married and they're saying, no, you don't understand. This really woke up our life in the bedroom. And, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. this is sweet. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's such a simple thing, but it's, it really works. Right, right. Well, I just, I can't thank the two of you enough for taking the time. Uh, and it really speaks to the fact that what if we all were to live to, to give? Um, what, uh, what rewards we can find there if we look for them, to your point. So thank you, the two of you. So excited to check out Go Giver Marriage. Uh, I think it will move right to the top of our reading list here for Jack and I in the evenings that we have together. Awesome. And um, just want to thank the both of you for helping all of us become a bit more aware now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.